So I have been reading some very good books recently. And you, whether you like it or not, I suppose, will recognize some themes of them over the course of my next several sermons, I imagine. One is a history of Islam called Destiny Disrupted. Another is a book on addiction and recovery by the comedian come mystic Russell Brand. One is a book about Islamic geometric design, which tries to describe how Islamic artists and mystics indicate the manifold unity of God by a repeating and evolving pattern meant to convey by geometric suggestion eternity. So there's a tattoo coming out of that one. And then I'm reading Michael Poland's How to Change Your Mind about applied psychedelics. As if there was any other kind, I suppose. In that one, uh, he describes an epiphany, Poland does, that he had while on a psychedelic journey. I'm not going to tell you what the epiphany was. Uh, to say so out of context would do a disservice to you and the author. But even as he wrote about it, he, he noted, it occurred to him, how trite the epiphany sounded on paper. <laughs> the revelation of this revelation of his appeared to him as entirely novel and astounding, but read rather more like a green card platitude. Uh, this, of course, is my job description. <laughs> uh, but then Poland observed something redundant. <coughs> he suggests that platitudes are perhaps nothing other in great truths drained of emotion. God is love without the overwhelming awe of either the ground of freaking being or love. Platitudes are nothing other than great truths drained of emotion. I tell you that because we Unitarian Universalists are historically famous, coming as we do from Puritan root, famous for our ability to drain emotion from truth. <laughs> and despite our claims of liberality, we stiltify in our grim propriety and invulnerable, or should I say, insufferable safety. And what I'm about to say, the theme of today's reflection is a great truth. And I wouldn't want you to think that I was serving you a plate of platitudes. So we shall endeavor in some way to reinvest emotion into truth, or at least perhaps some wonder into it, so as to make a difference. And here is the truth. This is it. This is what I want you to hear. This is your take home. But I don't want you to put it in like a carry-out container so that you can just microwave it when you're ready. <laughs> or, to, or to hang it in a neat little frame that you can hang on the kitchen wall. I want you to pretend that you have just been on an extended sojourn outside of your typical self-conception. I want you to pretend that roughly two and a half hours ago, you gobbled down some particular kind of fungi and have spent the interim peeling away the accumulated layers of illusion that you've come to call your life. I want you to hear this platitude in that 
imagine state. Two and a half hours into an open-hearted expulsion of ego while embracing the timelessness of being, you are pulsing with the rhythm of the universe and hearing the rush of God whooshing through your body as you turn your eyes back onto the world and with great waves of relief and release, but you've heard it before, see as though for the first time and in golden skyborne letters dripping with honey and sunlight, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> with great waves of relief and release. No one is remotely perfect. Not you. Not the one you see next to you. Not even your God or your rejection of somebody else's God. We are, all of us, defective, flawed, inherently so, originally, even little babies. And we do great injury to ourselves and each other when we assume otherwise. The expectation of perfection is in one another, or even in oneself, is so patently unreasonable that none of you would confess to employing it. And yet, before you swear that you would never hold anyone to the standard of perfection, remember one thing. I'm your minister, and I have seen you work. <laughs> the standard of perfection is particularly pernicious in this faith tradition, a tradition that seeks to save lives by assuring everyone that within them is a worth and dignity that is inherent. And that's true. I have faith that that is true. And that faith saves lives, that every person has an inherent worth and dignity that saves lives for those who need to hear it. And it does that every day. Now, inherent is a sort of safe and emotionless, very entirely merciless way of saying grace. What is inherent is unearned, which is not to say undeserved. You deserve your dignity and worth, however unearned, inherent, and grace given it is. You deserve it precisely because you are imperfect. And yet, all too often, we do not extend the grace of imperfection when that would be life saving or even just peacekeeping. <laughs> I suppose there are a few reasons why we fail to extend that grace, and the first is likely a misplaced attempt at self-protection. Imperfect as that is, it is also understandable. Now, I'm not talking about extending grace in instances where one is in danger of violence. I'm talking about those times when we, or those we interact with, are reactive and make the kind of mistakes for which amends can be made by apology and a resolve to do better. And yet even imperfections on that order tend to start a cycle of reactivity. There's probably some evolutionary reason for this where individual survival depends on group cohesion. So if somebody is imperfect in the group, we dispose of them. And if mere survival is your game, then perhaps reactivity will serve. 
But then can a group survive without empathy, without compassion, for the extension of grace for the imperfection of others is nothing less than the exercise of compassion and empathy. And it has the added benefit of modeling behavior you might like to receive when the bar set for you proves too high. Additionally, we are the unfortunate inheritors of that Puritan strain of perfectionism that mistook the search for God with the appearance thereof, who sought a selfless spirituality but all too often delivered vanity in the guise of mortification and a mere mimicry of selflessness. It is from those ancestors that we received the subliminal expectation of perfection. And then, too, there is a tension that is conjured when we seek to save lives by asserting that everyone is born with dignity and worth. I've seen the dismay that arises when people act in difficult or harmful ways. We are often surprised by this. And the attitude is one of, but how could they when they were born with inherent worth and dignity? So our first principle is a ball suffering that also aids and abets our inherited expectations of perfection. I say inherited, but it don't mean to let us off the hook. We take part in that. And that expectation is not only a wall against the miscreant, but a prison for the one projecting it. When you do not extend grace for others in perfection or for your own, you build a wall of disconnection. When we expect perfection, we build an impossible situation. I don't expect perfection, I hear you think. I just want you to behave well. But someone who behaves well all the time who never causes dismay is perfect. I find that when I don't expect you or anyone to approach perfection, I am a much more copacetic pastor, friend, and family member. Now, I try not to let my expectation for imperfection slip into cynicism, the angsty expectation of upset, just a gentle holding of something both delicate and sharp in my hand, something beautiful, a relationship, experience. So this does not mean that I excuse bad behavior, but the understanding that we are, none of us, perfect, buys me seconds. And in those moments, I can be reflective rather than reactive. In those non-reactive moments, I can be curious. Remember last week, last week we reflected on how curiosity is our great tool. For the moments where I can remember to be curious about imperfection, my own and others, I, or even just a situation, I can remember not to take it personally. The imperfection confronting me is not me. But my irritation and this only indicates that I have my own operative imperfection, which too I will handle gently. I will be curious and non reactive about myself. Speaking of 
Speaking of curiosity, I want to depart from the personal and wonder about the essential for a moment. I, I wonder about the origin of the imperfect. The question of human imperfection leads me to the question of imperfection in the fabric of being itself. <laughs> Because being itself, on the grandest and most essential scale, would seem to be, if looked at on the grandest or most essential scale, it would seem to be perfect. If everything <coughs> is interdependent, everything is interdependent, that would at least suggest an underlying, overlaying, and pervasive generative Unity. Unity suggests a kind of perfection. And it seems that we are the beings granted the ability to bear witness to that unity by that unity. Setting aside the primary questions of why the underlying pervasive generative unity would, for lack of a better word, want to witness itself or even diversify in the first place, or how imperfection came to be. There is a secondary question of why the underlying pervasive generative unity yearns to witness itself through itself, thus producing in us such in perfect translators. If we are the universe becoming conscious of itself, the universe is an idiot. <laughs> I mean, as far as we know, we are the only forms with consciousness. We could argue otherwise, and in fact, I think I have, but as far as we know, we are the only forms with consciousness, and we only have five senses. Six or seven if we're being generous, and 50 or something if we're splitting hairs. But we know that there are creatures on this planet, millions of them, that have a different or more or better senses. And we get consciousness. We get self-awareness. We are the universe becoming aware of itself? We imperfect idiots? This is a great mystery to me, and I'm mostly at a loss. But that's seldom stopped me in the past, so on a certain imperfection, I will put forth an imperfect hypothesis. So have you ever seen something so beautiful, something so moving and profound, and then tried to explain it and found that you do not have the words. And no matter what you say, no matter how you express it, it isn't quite right. It has nothing to do with your experience of it. It has only to do with your reproduction of that experience in a different form, in words, your words. So, in terms of the universe, we are that reproduction. We are that faulty articulation of our own witness. We are those ill-suited words the expressions of the unity and in the same way are imperfect articulations of its beauty. In the same way that our articulations of beauty can't quite get it. We are those articulations of the universe. <coughs> How does perfection articulate imperfectly.
I don't know. I haven't gotten to that part of the trick yet. Maybe it's that no one is perfect unless God is not perfect unless we are somehow perfected by imperfection. That is to say, perhaps no organism or idea is perfect unless imperfection is understood as part of the whole of its being. But I'm not sure I'm ready for that yet. <coughs> Maybe you are, only you would know. No organism or idea is perfect unless imperfection is understood as part of the whole of its being. The perfect includes imperfection. Hmm. I don't know. But I do know that, oddly enough, as imperfect articulations of perfection, we are the only creatures on earth that have a mind for the perfect, or an inkling of imperfection. My dog doesn't know it. And likewise, for the cousins of perfection and imperfection, or at least perceived imperfection and perfection, their cousins, good and evil. Outside the human mind, in the mind of our kindred creatures, there is certainly discomfort, pain, and even sorrow. But evil? So this makes me wonder if evil is a product of consciousness. Or perhaps is consciousness the first tool developed evolutionarily that can recognize an evil that was always already there. So this second question asks if evil is a given part of being itself, if it exists, period. And if I say, as I have said of late, that consciousness is a given, an inherent part of being, from the get-go, evidenced by the being of consciousness, then I must say that the quality that we recognize as evil is as well. And I didn't know that I thought that until I wrote that. That was startling to me to think that evil exists as a force of its own to entertain that possibility. And this leads open the question of whether evil is a result of consciousness or if it is, like consciousness, a thing itself, contingent and interdependent as it may be, like consciousness and everything else. At any rate, meditating on imperfection has carried us into a meditation on evil. That's not because imperfection is evil. Consciousness itself is a kind of imperfection. What I might rather say is that evil is the rampant extreme of a self-serving, self-centered consciousness, a trait whose seed is planted within each of us, which is why compassion is so crucial. Goodness, on the other hand, is also a result of consciousness, and since consciousness itself is an imperfection of being, then goodness is an imperfection. Goodness is the act of consciousness oriented beyond itself for its lack of completion, an orientation toward connection. As I wrote this, I was visited by a vision. And the vision I saw, I saw being, I saw being itself 
as a whole cloth comprised of smaller bits of cloth. I saw that every smaller cloth, every iota of being, has a tear in it, an imperfection. But it is by that tear that being connects up. Something like Velcro. <coughs> this wasn't an argument. This was a vision. Now engaged properly with the balance of curious mercy, being connects up and holds together is what the vision suggests. Being is made creative by its flaws engaged. Being were perfect, it would be an undistinguished monolith, and you would not be here. Perfection eliminates the need for connection. And connection feels good. Connection feels like love. Connection may be love. God is not perfect. God is love. Let us connect through our fractures with great ways of relief. You don't have to sing well, you just have to sing. So if you would please rise and body your spirit, let us close with Guide My Feet, hymn number 348. And before we get started, a special thanks to Saeed, who spent his first day with you today. And as far as I know, it was the only thing perfect about this service. Thank you.